Good afternoon and welcome to today's meet public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission to consider realignment and mid year review of the fiscal 2024 operating plan. I want to thank staff for joining us and for starting this briefing so late this afternoon. We just complete our annual priorities hearing where we heard from a wide range of stakeholders about safety problems that deserve our attention from window coverings to water beads to increasingly uh, fast e-bikes that seem to challenge the definition of bicycle. Hearing from parents who've lost their children, I'm reminded of the urgency and the importance of our work. And hearing from pediatricians, consumer advocates, government representatives, and industry underscores for me how many stakeholders are involved in the important efforts to improve product safety across the country. <clears throat> We're now gonna to turn to the harsh budget realities that we're facing for the rest of the fiscal year. Our appropriations for fiscal year 2024 is 1% below our appropriated uh, levels from last year. This may not sound like a lot, but a budget cut coupled with additional expenses like increased contract costs and well-deserved government-wide pay raise for our staff impacts our small agency significantly. We were cautiously optimistic about Congress would increase our budget so we could uh, pay for these increases, but we knew that we had to plan for a scenario where we had less than what we needed. So the commission trimmed many of the programs in the FY24 operating plan and asked staff to keep doing their best with less. Our staff found some cost savings, but unlike other mid-year adjustments <clears throat> where we considered new research projects or uh, Outside of what was included in the operating plan this year, we're essentially considering which of the operational and programmatic cuts the commission made at the beginning of the year can be restored. Staff has worked diligently to limit the impacts of these cuts on this, our safety work this year, but I'm concerned what will happen in the not so distant future if our funding is not increased. <clears throat> I'm gonna to continue to fight for higher funding from Congress. As an agency, we've consistently demonstrated the value of the work that we do to protect consumers through recalls, law enforcement, scientific advancements, improved standards, and disseminating valuable consumer product safety information. Nonetheless, we must also plan how best to maximize our public safety work with if funding levels remain low. So I look forward to this briefing and to work with my colleagues over the next several weeks to finalize this uh, FY 2024 mid-year adjustment and to continue to prepare for FY 2025. In a moment, I'm gonna turn this meeting over to staff so they can brief us. Once they've completed that briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions with multiple rounds if necessary. Briefing us today are the executive director, Austin Schlick, chief financial officer, James Baker, in addition, we have the table to answer questions from the commission <coughs> commissioners. We have Pam Springs, Director of the Office of Communications, Brian Burnett, Chief Information and Data Officer, Yvette Walsh, Director of Office of Human Resource Management, Dwayne Boniface, Assistant Executive Director, and Jennifer Sultan, Deputy Director of the Office of Compliance and Field Operations. Thank you all for being here. And Mr. Slick, will you please go ahead? Turn on your microphone. I think we have a power. James works. On. Oh, James, James works, so maybe they'll be Great. sharing involved. This is part of the uh, budget <laughs> constraints that we're talking about. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Chair Honsarik and Commissioners. Uh, thank you for making time for us on a busy day. Um, as the Chair just noted, this is not an ordinary mid-year. Most years, staff is able to report that operational savings during the first portion of the fiscal year will enable the Commission to fund new priorities and projects during the second half of the year. Uh, this year is different in two ways. First, the combination of a lower congressional appropriation for fiscal year 2024 and higher costs for salaries and expenses greatly outweighs achievable operational savings. After a $1.5 million cut to CPSC's appropriation and higher costs of about $8.1 million, the agency has effectively funded about $9.6 million lower than in fiscal year 2023. Second, the FY24 operating plan's debt ceiling level listed $9.6 million in cuts that were taken from fiscal year 2023 programs and should be considered for restoration if funds become available. The hope was that an increased appropriation for FY2024 would allow this. That did not come to pass. Congress reduced the annual appropriation of CPSC along with many other civilian agencies rather than increasing it. 
Accordingly, at this mid-year, we are estimating unexecuted balances of only approximately $2.9 million to apply against the restoration list for the current services level in the operating plan. Further, we've identified other critical priorities, such as replacing the deteriorating fire lab exhaust system at the National Product Testing and Evaluation Center in Rockville that were not apparent last fall. The four staff recommendations before you reflect the unfortunate reality that our current funding level is insufficient to fully satisfy the Commission's mission of protecting consumers against unreasonable risks of injury or death from consumer products. Simply put, we are trying to do the best we can with inadequate funding. Staff's mid-year recommendation number one is to authorize alignment of the staffing level and budget tables one and two of the operating plan with our budget situation. As you know, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 provided CPSC $50 million of funding for purposes including increased staff to be available over six years. The ARPA funding, together with comparatively favorable annual appropriation in fiscal year 2023, allowed the Commission to set a targeted staffing level of 585 full-time equivalent positions for FY 2024. By the end of this fiscal year, however, the ARPA funds will have been almost entirely utilized, and it would be unwise to bank on a compensating increase in CPSC's annual appropriation. To align the operating plan with the enacted appropriation and the drawdown of CPSC's ARPA funding, and given the possibility of continued constrained appropriations in future years, staff requests commission authorization to maintain staffing levels within the limits of available funding rather than at the 585 FTE level. Staff's recommendation number two is to use the modest unexecuted balances we foresee to fund approximately 10 projects prioritized by the Commission in the operating plan, as well as the fire lab exhaust system I mentioned and another significant equipment replacement project at the laboratory. Staff's recommendation number three is to update the mandatory standard summary table in the operating plan to reflect inter intervening developments, including new information that counsels further staff review of infant carrier firmness before proceeding to a proposed rule. Staff's recommendation number four is addressing a defect in the current performance measure for recall response rate. As stated in the operating plan, key measure 2.3.1 currently is calculated by comparing the total number of units successfully recalled in all recalls closed during the fiscal year, the total number of units that might have been addressed in those recalls. If a closed recall involved a particularly large number of units of the product, it will dominate the reported response rate for the entire year. For example, in FY 2023, closure of a single recall involving nearly 38 million fire extinguishers largely determined the reported recall response rate for all 163 recalls closed during the year. To provide a more accurate representation of recall responsiveness, staff proposes reporting the average response rate for all recalls closed during the fiscal year. This more reflective measure allows staff to recommend increasing the recall response rate target from 33% to 43%. I have with me at the table leaders from several of the key offices that participated in preparing the mid-year package, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. But first, CPSC's Chief Financial Officer, James Baker, will provide some additional context for staff's proposals. Thank you, Austin, and good afternoon, Chair Honsarik and Commissioners. I'm gonna walk you through a brief slide deck focusing on the Commission's current financial position. We can go, if we can start with the second slide, please. At this year's mid-year, we find ourselves having to adjust to an enacted appropriation of $150,975,000, which is more than $1.5 million lower than our fiscal year 23 enacted appropriation of $152.5 million. We have also two other factors that created decrements from our FY 2023 operating level. The first and most significant is a 5.2% pay raise, creating over a $6 million increase in costs. The other is the increase seen in non-pay inflation of 1.8 million related to increased costs for contracts and interagency agreements. These decrements are forcing us to manage at $9.6 million less than our fiscal year 2023 operating level. Hoping for the best and anticipating the worst, in December 2023, management implemented a critical hiring protocol to better control payroll costs and avoid having more staff on board than could be supported at the debt ceiling level of the fiscal year 24 operating plan. Currently, agency-wide staffing is at 554 FTE, a decrease of 17 FTE from the start of this fiscal year due to attrition. In the same vein, management will continue to implement the non-pay reductions and the debt ceiling level of the, F of the fiscal year 24 operating plan. These include 
$4.2 million for agency management and operations support, of which over $3.2 million is for IT, $1.7 million for hazard identification and reduction, $1 million for communications, $300,000 for compliance, $200,000 each for import surveillance and international, and $100,000 for inspector general contract support. Next slide, please. As part of the mid-year review, we projected what cost we anticipate incurring in fiscal year 25. Currently, the administration is proposing a 2% civilian employee pay raise in fiscal year 25, which will cost the CPSC an additional $2.2 million. Also, continuing the current inflation expectation of non-pay would be another $1.8 million for contracts, travel, and interagency agreements. Assuming we are operating under a continuing resolution for a significant time, or an enacted, an enacted appropriation similarly constrained like FY 2024's, we would be operating in FY 25 with a total annual appropriations funding decrement of over $13.6 million compared to the fiscal year 23 operating level. Prudent management dictates that the CPSC will need to continue closely monitoring and realigning staffing levels within these constrained funding levels. CPSC will also need to continue in fiscal year 25 the non-pay reductions identified in the fiscal year 24 operating plan at the debt ceiling level. Slide four. In fiscal year 2021, Congress appropriated $50 million in ARPA funds to the CPSC, which are available through fiscal year 2026. As of the end of fiscal year 23, CPSC had spent over $38 million of these six-year funds. Based on current plans, CPSC will obligate approximately $11 million in fiscal year 24. This would leave only $500,000 in available ARPA funding, which will be completely depleted in early fiscal year 25. The staff payroll costs currently funded by ARPA will need to be charged to the annual salaries and expense appropriations starting in fiscal year 25. This leaves nearly $4 million in ARPA recurring non-pay costs for which there is no alternative funding source other than the annual appropriation, which cannot absorb these costs at the constrained levels. These ARPA funded projects include, but are not limited to, e-filing project support, email listserv technology and systems access, marketing services, the enterprise analytics platform for AI, and operations and maintenance for the case management system and EPI and NICE systems. Next slide. As Austin mentioned earlier, this mid-year review has four staff recommendations for the commission. Recommendation number one aligns the fiscal year 24 operating plan with the CPSC's fiscal year 24 enacted appropriation of $150,975,000. This will continue the non-pay reductions from the 23 operating level that I previously mentioned. Again, the 17 staff currently funded by ARPA will continue to be funded with ARPA funding for the remainder of fiscal year 24 and will be transferred to the annual appropriation starting in fiscal year 25. In addition, this recommendation will permit the executive director to adjust staffing levels within the limits of available funding without applying the 585 FTE level in the fiscal year 24 operating plan. This recommendation also anticipates constrained funding and staffing levels in fiscal year 25. Next slide. Recommendation number two contains a prioritized list of 14 projects totaling nearly $4.5 million to restore or fund should realigned or unexecuted balances become available. Currently, we're estimating the amount to become available in fiscal year 24 to be around $2.9 million. These anticipated funds will come primarily from our reduced staffing levels, as well as some from contracts and agreements that are not awardable and projects that are awarded at a cost less than originally anticipated. Slide seven. Here's the list of projects that were not able to be funded to the debt ceiling level of the operating plan and continue to be unfunded at the FY24 enacted level. We recommend these be considered for restoration. This list also has two newly identified lab equipment requirements that have surfaced since the approval of the fiscal year 24 operating plan. Staff would fund the commission approved projects in priority order, subject to the availability of unexecuted balances and acquisition feasibility. Slide eight. Recommendation number three proposes to update the mandatory standard state. Since Austin mentioned these changes in his comments, I will not go into further detail. Next slide. 
Recommendation number four proposes improving the calculation used to determine the average recall response rate for all consumer product recalls and change the target from 33% to 43%. Again, since Austin noted this in his remarks and is further explained in the written briefing package, I will not go into detail. Final slide. Before turning this back over to our executive director, I want to thank the EXFM staff and managers and staffs in the program and operations support offices who helped put this fiscal year 24 mid-year package together. Their efforts and dedication are greatly appreciated. Thank you, James, and I echo the appreciation to you and your staff for putting the package together. Um, to members of the commission, we look forward to your questions. Thank you for the presentation. At this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from the commissioners. Uh, Ten minutes uh, with multiple rounds, if necessary. You know, for, first again, I'd like to thank you not only for the work and putting the presentation together, but the work that you've been doing over the past year and the years before that. The commission has honestly asked you to do more with less, and you all have responded. The number of recalls have gone up. The number of rulemakings have increased dramatically. The outreach that has been done uh, in terms of impressions online, as well as uh, placements in, in uh, reaching people in communities that have been underserved has increased dramatically. The research that has been done is out there. And across the board, we have pushed forward. That hasn't been without costs. And I think some of that is now being recognized now. The number one thing on your list is replacement of lab equipment. So these are uh, exhausts that has leaks in it. And in the normal course, we would have hoped to have done those things and replaced them, but now it's actually turning into something that we must do now. So we've pushed forward, we've asked for more, and you have answered, and I appreciate that. But at the same time, um, as you pointed out, this mid-year has been, unlike the ones in the past, it has been you know, focused on what we need to do and appreciate going through that and the decisions that we have to make. Um, looking at the list out there, I think we have a, a fair understanding of, or I have a fair understanding of the ones out there, but just to get a little bit more detail, um, you know, say Ms. Springs, the last one on there is uh, the reduction, re restoration of money that would be going to comms of uh, 57% decrease that was in there that I think equates to about $800,000 in terms of the outreach. Can you, uh, given this placement, it is le the least likely to be funded with the amount of money that will be kept for the year. Can you just share about what that means and what it's likely to not be funded? And if that one's not working, perhaps another one, perhaps we're going to have musical chairs. Okay. Well, normally it's ah, Dwayne go. Ray who does that, but I uh, appreciate Brian's. Uh, no, I think we got that. That was unplugged as we were rearranging the room following the. Thanks so much for the question. Um, in in short, if those funds, one hundred and ten or or eight hundred and ten thousand dollars, if they're not restored, it's going to have this significant. It went off. Um, I think. Austin, stop playing with your. <laughs> it's back on. Okay. User error. Um, it's going to have a significant impact on our ability to reach consumers, um, both widely and in a targeted fashion. So the our, our contractor, first of all, executes our signature safety campaigns: pull safely, anchor it infant sleep safety, carbon monoxide safety, um, all of which generate billions of consumer impressions every year. Um, they also help to execute our kind of seasonal campaigns, which get us a lot of press, and where CPSC is, is, is seen as kind of the established expert um, with the public, holiday safety, firework safety. But most important, our contractor helps ensure that our safety messages reaches as many consumers as possible through paid advertising on digital and non-digital platforms. Um, it allows us to, as I say, target our messaging to ensure that communities that need to hear it, hear it, African-American communities, Hispanic communities, and in recent years, the Native American community, Native American communities. Um, and we do that through 
billboard advertising. So not just digital, but we have to be able to reach consumers where they consume their news. It allows us to time our messages so that we can take advantage and do kind of rapid response. If there's a hurricane that's on the, on the horizon, we can target our carbon monoxide safety messaging to those communities so that they know how to operate their portable generator safely. And it allows us to track our messaging as well. So we know what messages are effective and which ones aren't. And I know that's important for a lot of, you know, a lot of the commissioners. You're spending all this money. What kind of an impact is it having? And so it allows us to, again, track our messaging so that we can be as efficient um, with the hard, hard earned dollars of the American consumer as possible. So, you know, I, I, I'm disappointed at being number last on the list, but, you know, I hope that uh, we will be able to come to some accommodation, but that's, that's what that, that uh, decrease means. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think we've talked about this before being able to reach the American public is extremely important for them to know who we are and the important message that we bring in a trusted voice. Um, so it's unfortunate, but I realize that we have so many competing priorities that are out there. Um, at this point, I'd love to hear from my fellow commissioners about the, the, their questions. So commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you. Austin, James, all the staff, uh, thank you for the presentation and, and the recommendations. Uh, I know that this year uh, is a leaner environment than years past, uh, and that makes this decision making that much more difficult. So I acknowledge that at the top. Uh, so uh, again, thank you for your work. Um, on recommendation number four about uh, uh, recall effectiveness metric. Uh, staff's proposing to set the target to 43% uh, as the revised recall effectiveness metric. And I'm curious, uh, one, how did we arrive at that number? Thank you for the question. Um, the chart that I, is in the package that you all received has uh, historical recalculations using the proposed new calculation. And so simply the proposed target of 43% is something that falls within that historical range, looking at the average calculation. Okay. Um, more broadly, uh, and I want to protect against the criticism, and I know it's th that, that the change to this metric is consistent with what GAO had recommended. Um, but to, to guard against uh, any accusations that we are somehow goosing the numbers or manipulating the statistics uh, to come at a more favorable outcome, can, can you present more broadly what the good government case is for uh, making the change to the performance metric that we've been using for several years now? So, Commissioner, I'll take that one, actually. Yes. Thank you, Austin. Why now? Um, the first and most important reason is that we've identified what we think is a significant flaw in the current metric that we're able to fix now. Um, so, if we delayed, then we would be fixing it for fiscal year 2025. If we do it now, we can fix it for fiscal year 2024. Um, to your point about not looking like we're goosing the numbers, um, two things. First of all, um, we are looking for a an approximately comparable, you know, the 33% translates within roughly to the 43%. Um, but beyond that, we would, in presenting the new metric, be clear that it has been changed. Uh, we would give information about the historical trends and, and note that this is a new measure uh, differently calculated. Okay, and, and that, th thank you for that. that. That gets to my next question, whether it would make sense uh, to continue to report the old metric and it wouldn't be burdensome to have both to, to provide some sort of comparison between uh, where we are and, and perhaps also to allow uh, uh, folks to see the impact of these sort of large unit low recall response. Uh, our contemplation would be to substitute and we would report for a transitional period, um, the old one, but we, we don't contemplate running the two metrics in the long term. Um, so, so report, uh, report for that transitional period. Okay. Um, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, last summer, EXRM staff, uh, Asked, asked agency staff to complete uh, the FY24 CPSC training needs assessment survey uh, to ensure that the training and development opportunities provided agents at the agency level meet the current and future needs of employees. Um, I don't expect you to memorize that, but could you provide the results of the survey so we get a sense of exactly what kind of training we contemplate providing in FY24-25? 
<laughs> Thank you both. <laughs> We're looking at providing training in reference to managing people and also decision making. Uh, we also need to provide training to our contract um, officers. Um, they're required to have uh, certifications and there are a number of training courses that they will need to take in order to ensure that they continue to play a major role in making sure that our contractors are following the contracts that they're supposed to be. Okay. Um, and and I just want one other thing, I'm sorry, Commission, I just wanted to make mention of in reference to those two courses. Those were based on a survey that was completed, assessment survey by supervisors and employees. That that's, I needed, think that's what I was asking about. Yeah, they needed the managing people and decision-making uh, courses. They consider those to be a huge skill gap within the agency. Okay. Um, and I see that looking uh, at uh, attachment A of the package um, where the, the staff is recommending restorations, um, specifically looking at item number 10 uh, with respect to agency-wide training, um, it would all allocate, uh, I guess it's $31,000 um, uh, to, um, uh, to to do agency-wide trainings. I'm, I'm taking a, a, a quick look at some of the recent trainings that EXRM has offered uh, and, and those include uh, like a, a two-day um, seminar on retirement planning, um, a class on uh, burnout and compassion fatigue that ran for two days from 8.30 in the morning to 4.30 uh, each day. And not to be facetious, but uh, uh, that sounds like the kind of thing that folks might actually be feeling a little burned out after sitting through. Um, I think my favorite example, a third class here uh, on priority task and time management uh, ran for three days from 8.30 to 4.30. Uh, you, you can't make this up. Uh, given the constraints that we're under and that we're going to be operating under uh, going forward, I, I do wonder whether this kind of multi-day course is the best use of our, our resources and time. Um, I'm curious what safeguards supervisors are utilizing to make sure that employees that are attending these multi-day trainings uh, also have sufficient time to complete their assigned tasks. I'm going to say that for, I believe that the supervisors are making sure that employees have that time in reference to managing the work and also attending the training. I also believe that with the training courses, they help them in their jobs as well. So okay. I think it's important that we understand that they need the training in order to also complete their mission within the organization. So I think it goes in hand in hand together. That's helpful. Are we keeping metrics to show whether employees are benefiting? From the training, for example, employees who attend the, the last class that I mentioned about time management uh, are, are actually managing their time through better after having taken a course like that. I'm not. I'm, you know what? I'd have to go back and double check. I'm not really sure, and I don't want to give you a false answer. So, if you don't mind, if I can get back with you, with I appreciate the Levette, and I, I, I thank you for for the answers. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, your your time and attention, Mr. Trumka. Thank you. Uh, I think the people of this agency provide the best return on investment um, of any place in government. And I wish Congress took that into account when deciding our appropriations so we didn't have to have difficult conversations like this because slicing us up the way that we've been sliced up makes makes us make very difficult decisions and people are going to be hurt by it. Um, but thank you for the work that you've done to make sure that despite all that, that we operate in this environment and make sure we continue to get all the work done that we can. Uh, I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I echo my colleagues in thanking all of you uh, for everything that you do, and I appreciate the package. I just have one question, and it's for you, Ms. Springs, and it's a bit of a follow-up to what the chair just asked. Um, when I was looking at uh, the entry for the $800,000 that um, would need to be restored, um, I wanted to ask you what those, uh, whether those items that you listed were illustrative, because when you answered the chair, you had a very long answer, uh, many of which were not included. So I'm trying to get an understanding, you know, what these items that were listed and how much they account for the $800,000, because it sounds like there's a lot more uh, that would add up to the $800,000. Sure. The 800, the, the answer that I gave was, and frankly, it wasn't even the complete answer. The, the 800,000 comes from a, a, our, our largest contractor in, in OCM, which is the name is immaterial. So everything that I listed is, is what that contractor does for us from a, from a communication standpoint. So the targeting, the, the paid advertising, the planning and execution of signature campaigns are all incorporated and encompassed in that 800,000. 
Okay, thanks. So this list is just sort of a very small example, like, for example, the video of the fireworks. Is that something? Yeah, I think that was just, a, I think it was a general, I don't know whether, oh, I saw you put your hand on it. Yeah, I think that was a general uh, assertion of, you know, a staffer. I didn't write this, so I can't, I can't really attest to it, but the answer that I provided to the chair um, is part and parcel of what a part of the service that we get from Finn, um, from our community, our contractor. Okay. And think, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I think the, the list here are illustrations of items that will be either incompletely funded or not funded at all if the amount is not restored. I understood that, but it sounded like Ms. Springs answered a much larger list of things that wouldn't be funded. And so that's what I'm trying to understand it, what, what the tension is, whether it's this list or it's the broader list that won't be funded. Uh, Ms. Springs list is the entirety of the subject matter covered by the contract. This list are illustrative items that we contemplate not being able to support that we would otherwise support if the funds are restored within the scope of that contract. Okay. All righty. Thank you so much. I don't have additional questions, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Ziak. Thank you, everyone, for your time today and the work you put on this. We have put, we are all in a challenging environment. I think it is prudent that you are planning for that environment for the foreseeable future. It's not just the people in this room that are under stress, but all of our employees here and at 5RP and around the country. So we're all going to work together and get through this. A couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Baker, you mentioned uh, the original reductions, uh, 3.2 were for IT, that's correct, that we didn't, and we're restoring, if I'm reading the, the tables correctly, we're restoring how much of that 3.2 million in IT and the up to the 10? Just a second. I, I know there's a, well, the math is, is somewhat immaterial. We're restoring about 1.6 million dollars. Oh, 1.6, okay. Uh, I, I would highlight that just to say, I think that's important. Uh, uh, some of the technical issues uh, we saw here today, uh, as well as the, the, some of the technical or IT issues we experience regularly. Uh, sorry, you want to? Well, I want to clarify. Of the 14 things that are listed there, that's $1.6 million. Now, we don't anticipate getting down through all of those listed. Okay. But I just want to point out that 1.6 million of those are IT that are up in that list for uh, restoration. Okay. The full 14, right, right. I understand, right. It doesn't, so the, some of that 1.4 is below the line. Copy, copy. Uh, I, I would uh, commend you for that. IT is something uh, that is often ignored, but is the backbone of so much of the work all of us do. So it's not exciting. Uh, it's not something that is easy to explain why it's necessary. But when your microphones don't work, when the IT goes down and we lose valuable uh, hours of work, uh, we notice it, and I would commend uh, Chair Honserik. Uh, we had so many significant IT issues before his arrival, and he made it a priority. And I, I told him if he accomplished anything, improving the IT here would be important. Uh, so again, commend him on that. Uh, follow up being, following up on Commissioner Feldman's questions on the adjusted performance measure, um, uh, Austin, can you? I understand what you're trying to accomplish here and why, and it does make sense to me, but to our broader uh, community, can you take a step back and explain what we were doing and why this makes more sense uh, just to build upon the not putting our thumb on the scale? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we do think it's an important um, uh, metric both for the agency and, and perhaps more importantly for the public um, to see the extent to which uh, our recalls are resulting in the, the promised remedy. Um, and uh, to, to indicate that, uh, we have as one of our performance metrics uh, a measure which, as currently calculated, um, is first, and this is important, is calculated when the recall, recall is closed, meaning that it's complete from the Commission's point of view. The work has been done from the Commission's point of view. Um, that is going to typically be one, two, three years down, uh, down the road. Um, so it, it's something of a backward-looking measure. Um, then for those recalls that are closed during the fiscal year, uh, we take the total number of units that 
were covered by all of those recalls collectively, and that's uh, the denominator. Uh, and then the numerator is the recall, the, the, the number of units for which through our monthly reporting system that we have with uh, participants in our recalls, uh, we uh, have an indication of the number of units for which a response was received from the consumer. And for those, for those units, or it may have been done by the manufacturer, um, um, or distributor for that matter. Um, uh, and then we divide uh, the number of units for which there was a response uh, by the total number of units that might have been recalled. And to use the example that I, I just gave, um, in fiscal year 2023, uh, the, by far the largest recall that was closed that year was a 27 recall of 38 million units of product. We had 58 million units of product covered by all the recalls, the 163, I believe it was, recalls that year. So one of the 163 recalls accounted for two thirds of all the units involved and the, uh, the recall effectiveness for that recall, uh, which was comparatively low, uh, resulted in an anomalously low recall response rate reported for that year. Um, and so the, uh, the intention of the new measure is to better give a picture of the actual performance of our recalls across the entire universe that was closed that year. And to simplify, I think, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong, we're, we're getting rid of the skewed results that, that could go operate in both directions. You could actually have one big recall have a major upside as well. And instead of doing that, we're getting a, a, a clearer picture of the effectiveness overall of our recalls, correct? That's our belief, yes. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Well, thank you again to staff for um, putting this together at this point in time and no more questions uh, here. I'm sure that the, the commissioners may have additional questions as we consider this over the next couple of weeks. And I look forward to working with them on, um, on our mid year. So thanks again to everybody. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.